Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. Back in Chapter 5, we talked about the binding theory. That's the principles that govern the distribution of particular types of DPs, anaphores, pronouns, and R expressions, to other DPs in the structure. We saw that particular structural configurations or structural relations have to hold over anaphores and can't hold over pronouns and R expressions. This was our binding theory. Now, since uh, chapter 5, we've added a lot of theory. We've added things like uh, levels of representation. These are things like destructure, um, spell out, LF, PF. And it's worth uh, thinking about how the binding principles interact with um, the operations that uh, map between these different levels of representation, like the movement rules. So, uh, in order to start this discussion, let's first do a quick review of the binding theory from Unit 5. So, recall that we proposed that there are really three different kinds of DPs. There are anaphores, there are pronouns, and there are R expressions. Anaphores are words like uh, himself or herself or themselves, which obligatorily refer back to an antecedent. That is a, another word somewhere in the sentence uh, that gives the anaphor its meaning. R expressions, on the other hand, can never refer back to an antecedent. R expressions are referring expressions, so they refer to uh, things real or imaginary uh, out in the world and not within the sentence. Pronouns are um, are a tricky, uh, tricky kind because sometimes they behave like anaphores and can be bound, but sometimes they behave like our expressions and refer to entities in the world and the discourse around us. Um, we mark the relationships between anaphores, pronouns, our expressions, and their antecedents by making use of indices. Those are the little subscript I's and J's and things we put after anaphores and after antecedents. And when two items share a, uh, an index, we, we say they're co-referent. Now, co-reference in and of itself is insufficient to describe the patterns that we find among these items. Instead, we need a, uh, another notion, which is essentially an extended form of C command. It's a C command where the two items that are in the C command relationship are um, co-indexed. We call this phenomenon binding, and there are two critical parts to binding, you'll recall. The first is um, A binds B if A C commands B. So they must be in a C command relationship, and they must be co-indexed. You'll also remember that binding is not a reflexive relation itself. It's, uh, it actually uh, cares about asymmetries. So um, if A binds B, that does not mean that B binds A. A is the binder and B is the bindee. And it's an asymmetric relationship where A typically asymmetrically C commands B. The opposite of being bound is to be free. And um, we actually state uh, the conditions on, the, uh, on these NP or DP types uh, using these two terms, free and bound. Anaphores must be bound. That is, they must have be in a relationship with an antecedent that consists of C command and co-indexation. Pronouns, um, uh, well, let me rephrase that. Our expressions must be free, so they can never be in this binding relationship. And pronouns must be free under certain circumstances. You'll remember that there's an additional restriction that's known as the binding domain. The binding domain uh, holds 
that the relationship between A and B in a binding relationship has to be a certain distance within the tree. So the binding domain we defined in chapter 5 is that the clause containing the anaphor or the pronoun uh, is considered the binding domain. So if you're an anaphor, you must find an, a binding antecedent within the uh, clause that immediately contains you. Now we are going to revisit this definition of binding theory in the next set of videos uh, in this unit. Um, because uh, it turns out that the notion that it's just the clause containing the anaphor or the pronoun doesn't really work very well in uh, all but the most um, general cases. In this, um, in, this chat, in this video, we're going to concentrate on what level the binding conditions hold. You'll recall that there are three binding principles, or binding, they're sometimes called binding conditions. Principle A is about anaphores, and anaphores must be bound in their binding domain. That means that an anaphore has to find a C commanding, co-indexed antecedent within the CP that dominates that anaphore. Um, principle B governs the distribution of pronouns. You can have a pronoun anywhere, but if you do, it must be free in its binding domain. So uh, a pronoun uh, cannot find an antecedent within the CP uh, that immediately contains it. Um, it could find an antecedent in a higher clause. That would be fine. But within the CP that contains the pronoun, there should be no antecedent. And binding principle C governs our expressions. Our expressions must always be free. They can never find a, uh, an antecedent anywhere. It doesn't matter what the binding domain is. For the most part, we're not going to be uh, terribly concerned about principle C because that holds no matter what. We are going to be concerned about the distributions of pr uh, principle A and principle B because they um, have greater restrictions. Okay, so now let's turn to the issue of levels of representation. So let's ask the question, where do the binding conditions hold? Do they hold of D structure? Do they hold of LF? Do they hold of PF? Do they hold um, in uh, at spellout? Um, there's conflicting evidence we have here. So let's take, for example, um, the sentence, which pictures of himself did one hate? Now what you'll notice here is there is an anaphor, and that anaphor appears to be bound by Juan. So there's an obligatory co-reference between Juan and himself. But after we've done WH movement of this whole complex WH phrase up to the beginning of the sentence, Juan no longer C commands himself, right? Himself um, is only C commanded by Juan before you did the WH movement. So in the underlying sentence, Juan hated which pictures of himself, Juan does indeed C command himself. And so binding condition A is met before you do the movement. But once you do the movement, you disrupt that C command relationship between Juan and himself. So um, this suggests that um, binding condition A might happen at D structure before you do any movement. So imagine what you do is you construct your tree and then you look at your tree to see um, if the binding conditions are met. Uh, you look and say, are there any anaphors? Yes, there's an anaphor. Is it C commanded by its antecedent? Juan, yes it is. Check mark, we've met binding condition A. Then you do WH movement. Um, so that's an argument that uh, binding conditions happen before um, movement, which would suggest they hold at D structure. The problem with that is there's also almost equivalent evidence that shows that the binding conditions have to hold after movement. So take this sentence, Juan wants himself to be appealing. Himself starts off as the subject of, of to be appealing, and it undergoes subject to object raising. So uh, movement from this embedded 
um, subject position into the specifier of Agarro. Uh, it does this for a variety of reasons. Uh, it does it for case because this is not a case position. So it needs to find case in the higher clause that's uh, subject to object raising. Now, um, this is slightly problematic because the anaphore here himself in its base position does not meet um, binding condition A because as an anaphore, it has to find its antecedent within the CP that immediately uh, dominates it. So here's um, where the anaphore would start out and there's a CP right above it and there is no antecedent within this CP. So this, um, at least at the D structure, would appear to be a violation of principle A. But when we move this element into the higher clause for case reasons, himself finds itself within the same clause as its antecedent. So himself uh, is in the same clause as Juan, it's dominated by the same CP, so therefore, um, <clears throat> it can be bound in this particular position. <clears throat> but that only happens after movement. So our previous example showed cases where uh, anaphores had to uh, meet condition A before they moved. And here we have a case where an anaphore must meet condition A only after movement. This is a real problem for us. So our binding domain at D structure does not contain an antecedent. But the binding domain, but after you do the movement, the binding domain uh, shifts. So this anaphore um, shifts, shifts and finds a new um, binding domain and uh, it can find an antecedent. So it meets condition A after movement. Then we have a conflict. We have some evidence that it's before movement and some evidence that it's after movement. So where do binding conditions hold? Um, one uh, possibility that might have leapt to mind that we have solved similar sort of conundrums by using uh, ordering. But in the after the level 13 model of unified um, movement, we technically only have one movement rule which is move. So you can't really order uh, uh, binding condition A, then move, then binding condition A, then move. There's no way to, to sort of make that work out. Um, the, and when you think about it at a deep level, the level that binding really should hold at is LF, the, lex the logical form, because what binding does is, is, is it establishes meaningful relationships between two DPs. And meaning is calculated at LF. The semantics uh, holds at LF. So in an ideal world, your binding conditions should hold at LF. But we have evidence they show showing up at least at D structure. How do we fix this? Well, one possibility comes from a recent notion about what movement really is. We're going to talk about this in more detail in the videos associated with chapter 19 on merge. Um, this is a, a recent advance in the thinking about what movement is and what phrase structure is. Uh, the details of merge don't need to concern us here. Instead, we can uh, think about one particular um, portion of merge that's going to solve our problem for us. Chomsky, in 1993, in the work that, where he um, proposed merge and similar relationships, he, um, he suggested that movement isn't really movement, but it's a copying operation. And what happens in a language like English is that you simply don't pronounce the original copy, you pronounce the second copy, the copy that's in, in a different position. So imagine um, that the representation of a sentence like, which pictures of himself did Juan like, uh, starts off as Juan likes which pictures of himself, and uh, which is the, the, the order that gives us the correct binding relationships because Juan C commands himself, 
But then when you do movement, you uh, take a copy of this um, string and you put it at the front of the sentence in the specifier of the CP because it's WH movement. And in English, you simply don't pronounce the lower copy. You pronounce the higher copy. Now, uh, rather than actually taking the object and moving it to this position, what you're doing is creating copies. And you're pronouncing some copies and not pronouncing others. Um, this is a little bit like ellipsis, right? So you, you have multiple copies of the same item in the sentence, and you simply choose not to pronounce um, the second one that is a, re a repetition of what has previously appeared. Um, the relationship between the two copies is sometimes called a chain. So there's a chain of copies in the sentence. And if we had multiple cases of WH movement where we were moving an item up and up and up and up cyclically, as we had to do for the minimal link condition, you would have multiple copies on the way, and all those copies would be linked in what's called a chain. So that's the relationship between the copies. Now, uh, we are able to explain the differences um, in binding domain in the sentences like this one and the sentences that we saw with subject to object raising by changing our definition of principle A so that it makes reference to chains. So here's our revised principle A. We say one copy of an anaphore in a chain must be bound in its binding domain at LF. So what this means is in a sentence like which pictures of himself did Juan like, which and then silently, which pictures of himself, there is one copy of the anaphore that meets condition A, principle A, um, because it is bound, it is C commanded by Juan, and it is co-indexed with Juan. So this copy meets the condition. The higher copy does not, but that doesn't matter because binding principle A says one copy of an anaphore in a chain, and we have a chain here, must be bound in its binding domain. So in this sentence, the um, silent copy meets condition A. In the other sentence, where we saw that um, condition A seems to be met after movement, um, so this is the case where we do subject to object raising of himself from this, uh, from this embedded subject position, because it's not a case position, into this higher agar OP, uh, after we've done this movement, the higher copy can be bound by Juan. So Juan uh, C commands himself, and they do so within the same uh, binding domain. Uh, the lower copy does not meet condition A, but that's okay, because it the principle A simply says one of the copies has to meet the condition. So uh, in the first sentence, the lower copy meets the condition. And in the second sentence, the higher copy meets the condition. And that's how we can explain this paradox of the relative ordering of movement and binding principles. We simply state that the binding principles hold at logical form. And the logical form contains all the copies in a chain, a chain of movement. And if you have an anaphor, you simply have to look to see if one of those um, positions meets principle A in that it is C commanded by an antecedent within its clause.